Okay, hi all. Uh, I'm Erik, and uh, I'm doing my PhD at uh, Utrecht University in the Netherlands under the supervision of uh, Merel, Merel Soans, sitting here. And um, uh, my PhD focuses on the role of water birds in sea dispersal. And in that context, I've been uh, looking at the movement ecology of mallards in the Netherlands. And we do this in strong collaboration with the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, and we're funded by the Dutch Science Organization. So first about uh, dabbling ducks. Uh, Andy Green and Johan Elmberg, they, uh, they have a recent paper out uh, nicely summing up the uh, important ecosystem services provided by dabbling ducks. And I won't go through all of them, but what is really important to emphasize in, if you look at this list is that all of these ecosystem services have a very strong spatial component. I'll mention a few, like provisioning, especially uh, popular here in uh, North America. Uh, we hunters, they, uh, they, they, use, they usually shoot um, uh, ducks flying from their roost sites to their, uh, to their foraging sites or the other way around. And of course, in, especially in Europe also, they, they shoot a lot of uh, migratory uh, uh, ducks. We know very well that uh, especially mallards, they are uh, transmitting a lot of disease. They carry disease, uh, even influenza viruses. And of course, there's also a very strong spatial uh, uh, context to that. And um, which falls nicely into my project. Uh, dabbling ducks also play a very important role in the dispersal of plant seeds, invertebrates, and, uh, and uh, other microbes other than, uh, than uh, disease. And there's a very strong spatial component to that as well, because uh, if a mallard or a duck in general wouldn't move, then uh, the seeds or other organisms that they would eat or that would stick to their uh, feathers, they, they wouldn't get anywhere. So we know now that uh, movement of these dabbling ducks is very important. And there are two uh, major factors that, uh, that affect movements uh, that are currently changing. We all know that uh, wetlands, wetlands are being, destru being destructed and fragmented. And we wonder, how does this fragmentation of these wetlands, of course, ducks have a preference for wetlands, how does this change the movement behavior of, uh, of ducks? And also, there's climate change. We know that uh, several weather parameters, they affect the movement behavior of mallards, of ducks, and uh, these are also changing. So how, are, uh, how is this uh, affecting the movement behavior in the Netherlands? So these, uh, these, all, these are, I actually already mentioned them, uh, our questions. So how, do, how is spatial behavior of mallards in the Netherlands affected by landscape configuration? And um, for this, we, we chose uh, several landscapes that were uh, differing in, in landscape configuration. I'll come back to that later. We also wonder uh, which weather conditions affect these um, movements of mallards. And uh, because of our collaboration with the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, we were also able to check what the effect is of natural uh, infection with uh, low pathogenic avian influenza viruses on these movements. So we focus not on migrational movements. We've seen a lot of long distance uh, movement. But we focus on daily movements, landscape scale, regional scale. Uh, so um, I'll explain a bit more about that. So our study species is the mallard. Uh, and why mallards? Mallards are extremely abundant in the Netherlands and are also the most numerous uh, duck species in the world, actually. We have a breeding uh, resident population of uh, four to 500,000 uh, pairs. So that's really a lot of birds in a very small country. Um, they also carry uh, a lot of different types of uh, uh, avian influenza virus subtypes. Um, actually, it's, the mallard is a species in which most of the subtypes have been found. And also, uh, our mallard is like the uh, temperate toucan, I can say. It's carrying a lot of seeds. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a, an omnivorous bird species, but especially in winter, uh, they switch their diet towards seeds. Uh, they eat a lot of seeds, and they're, they're very generalistic. They, they don't select for cer certain species. They eat anything they encounter, basically. Uh, and a recent uh, uh, review of, of diet studies has shown that uh, mallards in, in Europe uh, or at least in the diet of mallards in Europe, they found more than 400 species of uh, plants, both aquatic and, and, and non-aquatic plants, terrestrial plants. So what we did is we did a GPS tracking study with uh, CatTrack GPS loggers. And um, these loggers are very cheap. This has, this has the advantage that you can increase your uh, sample size. It has also some disadvantages that I won't go into much, uh, too much detail now. 
Uh, they're non-solar, so they work on the battery, which is important. Uh, they're about 30 grams, including the case and the harness, uh, which is about 3% of the uh, body mass of the mallard. We set them to record the GPS position every 15 minutes, and this means that they will work for about 18 days. But there is a lot of variation in that. Some, some loggers, they work very poorly, and they last only a couple of days. And we did our study in uh, winter uh, of 2012 and 2013. So it's a non-breeding season, and these are non-breeding movements. And as I said, uh, we use four different landscapes. And I'll explain you about landscapes now. I already noticed that the, the A, B, C, and D uh, fell off the chart, but they correspond to these, uh, uh, A, B, these numbers in the, in the corners. These are our four landscapes, and they're distributed uh, through the Netherlands uh, on a gradient from west to east, which is by chance also uh, more or less a gradient from very wet landscapes to fairly dry landscapes. And um, we chose these different landscapes to more or less simulate the uh, fragmentation over time, although we cannot measure over time, we, cannot, we can measure fragmentation of the wetlands uh, um, on a spatial scale. So this landscape is a typical Dutch landscape, very flat, uh, with uh, meadows um, cut off every, like every 30 meters by a ditch. It's very wet um, and, and matters of ample uh, place to forage and roost. This is a lake area which is uh, also, of course, uh, extremely wet. But the big difference between these two landscapes is that uh, the amount of shoreline is uh, much less in this, uh, this area. And, and mallards, they don't really like open uh, water. They don't really like to sit in, in, in op on open water. They prefer uh, shoreline, shorelines, or to be close to shorelines where the water is less deep and where they can forage. Uh, third landscape is uh, this, um, where we have a central uh, lake with uh, several water bodies around it and in the far east, far east relatively speaking, uh, we have a fairly dry landscape with uh, one lake and very few other water bodies in the area. And apart from this variation in water uh, connectivity, uh, we've picked these landscapes because they're very similar. They're all very flat, they have the same amount of uh, uh, forest uh, cover, or hardly any actually. Um, so we try to really vary the uh, wetland connectivity here. We caught mallards in these four places. Um, on three, in three landscapes, I used uh, homemade traps, uh, which are these traps. Uh, they uh, work pretty well, but it, there was uh, one place where we used another type of trap. It's the traditional duck decoy, which is uh, basically a lake with connected uh, funnel uh, entrances or funnel traps. Uh, around the, uh, in, in different corners of the lake. And they use uh, tame mallards to lure uh, wild mallards into these funnels. And then you can catch them. It was a very efficient way and a traditional way uh, to catch these mallards. So we got a nice sample size there. These four landscapes, they differ in the, uh, like I said, in the water connectivity. And I have, I have some uh, parameters here. The number of water bodies was uh, uh, differing very much, but uh, I don't want to focus too much on that. Uh, rather, I would focus on the shore length, which is clearly uh, the highest in this, uh, this very wet polder landscape. It's a lot less high in this, uh, this uh, lake landscape, lake area, where the water uh, surface water uh, area is, uh, is much higher. So these are basically the two very wet places, and these, these are uh, the two very dry places, which this is clearly drier than, uh, than, than this one. I use this same order in the graphs that I'm going to show now, or next. Um, so we did GPS tracking, and we have data in the end of 102 mallards um, distributed over the four landscapes, but not quite equally. Uh, we have a lot more data on the wet places than on the, uh, the drier places, and that's because our recapture rates were much higher in the, in the wet places. Um, these cataract loggers, one of the disadvantages is that you cannot uh, remotely download the data. So you have to recapture the birds. And we had uh, about 63% uh, success. And for the birds that we did not recapture, we had breaking points in the harness, so they would not uh, live with these uh, loggers for their entire life. And uh, like I said, there was quite some variation in the longevity of the, of the batteries. So in the end, to compare the ducks between uh, the, three, the four landscapes, we chose uh, we selected the first eight days of all the tracks to uh, compare them. 
So what are the general patterns that we found over across these four landscapes? And this is the, the very wet landscape, but it's not a very uh, de detailed uh, map. You would, we, yeah, you have a lot of uh, ditches here in this, uh, this whole area. Um, what, we, what we usually saw is that these birds, mallards, they use one specific roost site. They have a very high fidelity to it. And um, they move very short distances uh, between several hundreds to several kilometers uh, only to a foraging site and, or, and they use over this eight day period one, two, maybe three at most foraging sites. So they're very selective in where they go and, and which uh, core areas they use. These different colors, by the way, they, uh, they uh, present, they represent if it's a day or nighttime uh, uh, sample. So it's very clear that they use this during the day as a roost site and they forage at night in the folder. We selected flights from our tracks and if we plot them uh, over the time of day and through the uh, non-breeding season, there's a very clear pattern that arises where the points are very clear, uh, clearly uh, uh, lumped. And indeed, if we plot uh, sunset and sunrise in this graph, uh, it coincides very well. So clearly these birds have a very uh, diurnal, uh, or a, they, they, um, they switch behavior during, between day and night. They uh, forage during night and fly therefore uh, back to the roost in the early morning just before sunrise. And just after sunset they, they fly out towards their uh, roost, their foraging site. But it's also important is to see that uh, during the day and during the night sometimes they do indeed uh, also fly. The flight, uh, the number of flights per day, uh, so therefore is more than, than two, um, and uh, did not differ between the three, let's say, driest sites. Although uh, in this this polder area, uh, the birds didn't fly very much, and um, here you can see a track. Um, it's one duck, uh, two days of one duck, and uh, this bird clearly flew uh, between the roost site and and the foraging site. Uh, back and forth, and maybe this was also a flight. Uh, so these flights are, they didn't fly very much here. Um, the distance they flew is also very low, very short. Um, in the polder, in the wettest sites, they fly uh, around 500 meters to uh, go, come from their roost site to their foraging sites. In the drier areas, where the water bodies are further apart, as we expected the uh, flight distances are somewhat larger um, variation also is quite high here because we had a, a little less uh, birds here and 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 none of the uh, flights was really very far uh, at least not the, the daily flights so with it's a couple of kilometers you've had it but it's 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 uh, confirming our hypothesis that these birds that are in in dry landscapes where the, where the fragmentation is higher, so where water bodies are further apart, they, burst, they have to fly further to find suitable uh, foraging sites. So then um, home ranges. We, um, we determined the home range size based on uh, uh, minimum convex polygons. And what's very clear to see here also, it's of course very well, uh, very related to flight uh, distances is that the uh, home ranges in the wet areas are much uh, smaller than the home ranges in the drier areas. Uh, if we then uh, determine the home range size based on the kernel utilization densities, where you uh, sort of filter out these areas that they only use to fly over, uh, and you only select the foraging and roosting sites, then we see that the differences uh, in, size, in size are much less, but still there are some uh, trend that uh, the birds in dry areas use uh, larger home range sizes. Then what's really important for uh, seed dispersal, of course, is that uh, if, you, uh, if you're picked up by a duck in a wet area, you will probably want to, uh, to be brought to another wet area also because you're probably able to germinate there. And what we saw is that in any landscape, birds have a very high preference for, uh, for water. Uh, they select more water than you would expect based on random points. So this is uh, distance from water and this is the proportion of cells that's uh, at that, at, uh, within that distance of, of water. And what we see is that the uh, uh, arrivals of flights, they arrive always uh, closer to water than what you would expect uh, based on random points in the landscape. 
And what's interesting is um, if you tear uh, these apart between uh, the landscapes, that uh, it doesn't matter if you're in a really wet landscape or in a very dry landscape, uh, the arrivals are always about as close to water uh, in these landscapes. So they really select their habitat. Uh, then, shortly, uh, some effects of avian influenza viruses. Um, we looked at uh, the effect of, of uh, infection of, of avian influenza viruses on the local movements, and that's the movements within patches. Uh, we didn't see any effect there between infected and non-infected birds. And, uh, however, if we looked at regional movements, so that's the, the movements on the scale that I just showed you the, the maps of, uh, then we see that uh, infected birds actually move less, and it's a bit, deceive, uh, it's a bit deceiving this, this picture, but the higher it is, um, the less movements uh, they had, because this uh, PC1 was negatively correlated to uh, flight distances, and uh, like I have here, number of flights, and wind size, and, and foraging time. So infected birds seem to be impaired in their movements on a, region, on a regional scale. We were also interested in weather. Uh, if we looked at non-infected birds, then there seemed to be no effect of weather at all on their movement behavior. Uh, there was no effect of wind or pre pre uh, precipitation and also no uh, effect of temperature. However, when uh, these birds were infected, so probably in a uh, less, uh, optim less uh, optimal state, um, they were slightly affected by uh, these different weather uh, conditions. So that means that uh, again, this is uh, a bit uh, inversed. The effect is uh, um, when there is a lot of wind and precipitation, uh, these infected birds, they move less. And for temperature, when it's really cold, they also move less than the non-infected birds. So there is an effect but on, of weather, but only for birds that are in, uh, in not such a good physical shape. So to uh, sum up, what's the effect of these movements on uh, ecosystem surfaces? Um, we looked at reduced availability of wetlands within a landscape, but it didn't really change uh, any flight frequency or uh, the daily routine. So the, their routine is really remains the same, and we predict that if within a landscape the availability of uh, water uh, decreases, they will maintain their daily routine. Um, but if they have less water available, they will uh, perform longer flights and they will have therefore also longer, uh, larger home ranges. Natural uh, avian influenza infection negatively affects the re re regional movements. It was not a really huge effect, but it did uh, affect their behavior. And uh, weather only has an effect when these birds uh, have something that uh, impairs their movement. Um, within the range of uh, wetland availability that we studied, uh, of course, in the Netherlands, you'd never get a really dry landscape, so it was all relatively wet. These matters, they continue to provide their ecosystem services because there's nothing changing in their daily routine. If we look at seed dispersal, they will keep flying as much as they do in very wet landscapes, so they will uh, continue to, uh, to, to transport seeds. Um, dispersal distances are therefore uh, increased because they have to fly further to find uh, suitable habitats. Um, it is, however, unclear uh, how fragmentation affects the number of, of birds that are within a landscape. If you have, because of uh, fragmentation, less, uh, less birds in an area, then the quantitative scale of, for instance, something like seed dispersal will be less. So our next step is going to be uh, to implement these uh, movement data in uh, the conceptual framework uh, of SOAR et al., in, um, which combines animal movement with seed uh, movement, seed dispersal. And there are some more interesting, some other interesting, interesting thing that, uh, things that you can do with this. Um, we can then uh, apply this uh, knowledge on, uh, for instance, predicting what the effect is going to be of wetland restoration projects, um, where our seeds are going to end up in the places where we want them to end up. And also, it's very interesting uh, to find out uh, how birds move uh, within areas where you have a lot of chicken farms, uh, where uh, even influenza might become a big problem. I have to thank a lot of people who uh, worked within this project, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions?
dryness and the movement pattern or the gravitation time or the specificity type that might actually lead to higher density of steam in the deposited type. So the steel stays close to water, but because there are less water, they have higher density of the steel. In the later, they will have or the retention time will be longer or the effect because they are giving more dry food. Yeah, those are uh, a lot of questions, and they're all very interesting to look at. Um, but uh, uh, what I think is that they use, they, they keep using uh, like the similar type of habitats, uh, wet habitats, and they will um, uh, therefore uh, uh, probably uh, eat the same types of seeds. And so in that thing, sense, I don't think there there's anything that's uh, going to uh, to change. Um, but um, based. Your question was also if there's going to be clumping or aggregation of seeds in those places that remain in the landscape. Um, in the case of seed dispersal, it's, ha it's hardly ever one vector that, plays, uh, that, that, that determines where the seed ends up. And especially in the case of water, it, like with these, uh, these ducks, uh, when uh, seeds are defecated in a wet area in water, it's very likely that they will, be, they will spread out uh, even further. So I don't think there's a lot of aggregation, or not, not in such a scale that it's going to be a problem. Does that answer your question? Or at least one of your questions? Yeah? Any more? Thank you.